Sonic Adventures. And this has nothing to do with the adventure games. Well, sort of. It's a French comic. Huh, it even has Amy and her Fleetway design on it. We start out in space, where Eggman laughs in his little spaceship, which goes into a bigger one. Eggman's told by his badniks that they had surprised Sonic in the Marble Temple on Angel Island. Oh, so even though this continuity is an old one, to the point of having the Robotnik design, it still doesn't call it the Floating Island. That's inconsistent. I like that it's the Marble Temple and so it's original though. Anyways, Eggman says to bring him the prisoner, and it turns out Tails is here. I hope this comic actually gets interesting instead of being just like the games. Huh, it turns out Sonic was made prisoner. And Eggman brags in front of him while Sonic's chained up. I'm just waiting for Sonic to Deus Ex Machina bullshit break free of the chains. But I've been watching too much AOSCH. Eggman reminds Sonic that he was the one who made Sonic this super Sonic creature. So for once, they do have a proper origin for Sonic's speed, and he wasn't just a brown hedgehog that could still go fast from the start. And it's impressively gutsy that they have Eggman say damn. He is a villain after all, and a human old man, so there's no reason whatsoever to be opposed to this. Though this is a fan translation of a French comic book. But uh, it's, it's kind of the same way in French, like darn is the same word as damn, because it's maudit. I also love that Sonic reminds us that Eggman used to be a good person in Kinto Board, just like in Fleetway and the promotional comic from 1991. With this backstory for Eggman and Sonic being in three different continuities, it makes me wonder if this was supposed to be canon to the games too at some point before Sonic Team got all butthurt about how they didn't have a hand in that kind of canon. It's not Japanese enough for them. Because come on! If it was something only copyrighted to STC, it'd only be an STC thing. It's much like how the Sad Am characters like Sally appeared in multiple continuities. And go figure, they actually belong to Sega of America. No wonder they could appear that often. I wish this All the World's Evil When Incident backstory was just confirmed to be canon to the games already. Because I just want to know why Eggman's so ridiculously evil. And the fact that they explain it already makes it a objectively superior backstory for him, compared to... Oh, he has a grandpa named, named with, with the last name Robotnik. Oh, okay, how does that explain why he's evil? Eggman says he plans to reunite the magic emeralds too, and then he gets interrupted, and Abadnik gives him a bag with the emeralds. Sonic then sees Tails' tail sticking out, so Tails is actually here to save him, and isn't just a kidnapping victim. Good! Eggman says that with the emeralds, he's king of the world. If this was Archie, Sonic would have already freed himself by going intangible by now. Oh bullshit! Sonic frees himself from the chains with no attempt whatsoever at a proper explanation for how the chains got slashed! You know what, Archie is better because at least intangibility powers is an explanation. I thought Tails would save him. What's the point of him being up here then if he's not gonna do anything? He supposedly punches Robotnik, but I don't care because I don't actually see his fist collide with his face. Then all of a sudden he asks Tails for help. He went from an invincible god, Mary Sue, to suddenly being vulnerable like this in the span of one page. Oh, I see. He's falling through a hole that leads out of the spaceship. And since he punched Eggman so that he isn't holding the bag with the emeralds anymore, the bag falls towards Mobius as well as him. And Tails says, Oh dear god, Sonic, you're completely crazy! At least that woke me up for a second. But dialogue alone can't make this generic comic interesting. So did someone push a button to make him fall through that hole? Tails goes after Sonic, Eggman calls all units with his microphone, and as I figured, Sonic surviving the fall makes no sense. Tails grabbing his hand before he would fall into the river shouldn't prevent him from getting hurt. The sheer momentum he'd have from falling so far would mean that any sudden stop would kill him. And it's not explained that he has rings to make him invincible right now. Eggman immediately goes towards Mobius in his Eggmobile, and he's at least shown as a threat as he orders his badniks to destroy the continent. But Eggman's supposed to be about ruling, not destroying. Use a different villain for that. But I guess he's just that desperate to get rid of Sonic. He's officially lost his mind then. It turns out that according to Tails, there's somehow still tons of unexplored regions on Mobius. See, even in a continuity that's way too much like the games to the point where it's just a Sonic 3 adaptation, even they use the term Mobius like it's nothing. In Sonic swimming, he goes across the river. 
He says it's nice that the green birds weren't made robots, just as we see some creepy fish with teeth go after them. Tails talks as if most of the world looked like this nature-filled jungle before Robotnik. So he is a big threat, and it's probably polluted and mechanized the world. Then Sonic gets dragged underwater, and he reveals that he's totally forgot that real animals can be dangerous too. So these really aren't bad nicks. Fuck the story for having Sonic talk underwater though. Every time this happens, it shows that there's no care put into making the story make sense. Then out of nowhere, he reveals that he has a souvenir from Hydro City that can get rid of these jaw scales. And sadly, a note on the page breaks the fourth wall worthlessly, as if I wasn't uninvested enough in this issue as it was. Like, he just came to Angel Island. Why would he have a souvenir from Hydro City? Sonic turns left and right, and somehow he sends the fish away from him, sending bubbles out of him, which magically freed him from his situation. This comic deserved to be cancelled. If this is how he'll get out of most dangerous situations, then even AOSCH is way better. Because at least when Sonic was getting disguises and materials out of nowhere for his Day 6 Machinus, it was actually interesting to watch, and it took some creativity from the writers every time. This is just confusing. Combine that with the fact that Sonic can inexplicably swim, and he basically has no weakness in this comic. If I wanted something exactly like the games, with no interesting hook to keep my attention, I'd just watch the cutscenes of the games again, and Tails stupidly asks him where he was, when that should have been obvious. Sonic tells Tails to follow the river fast, and there's an explosion that hits the water because Eggman's already found where exactly they are in this massive jungle. Did Eggman have a tracking device in Sonic's fur shoes? Is that why? I doubt they'll bother to explain that either. With the first issue, you need to wow your audience, not make them jaded and disappointed every time something important happens. Of course, some flying badniks start showing up and raining fire down, and Eggman's flying right behind them and tells them to destroy all the swarming, useless life. He's ridiculously dark in this comic. He has to have gone crazy by now because this is destroying, not ruling. Of course, this would be justified for once if he's absorbed all of the world's evil in an experiment. At least I assume that's what happened, because they made a vague reference to Fleetway's Eggman backstory. And why else would Eggman go from being non-stop good to like this? So this does actually make just as much sense as him being a sadistic ruler, since he's got all the world's evil in him. For once it makes sense that a villain's just doing stuff to be evil. Also, why is Eggman laughing like the cow in Sesame Street? That's not intimidating. Sonic swims across the river at super speed, urging Tails to go after him as more badniks parachute into the jungle. Am I really expecting to take these robots Sonic and beat in one hit each seriously? There's no civilians for them to threaten, so why is there so much focus on them as a deadly army? A comic of nothing but these guys threatening Sonic would be the most uninspired Sonic material ever. I get him being scared of the missiles, though. The Badniks all go to the river as the water looks yellow now, and Eggman's right up close to them. Sonic says that there's not a single ring in sight. Oh, now the Badniks are threatening. Okay, so that's why they're deadly. He can beat them all in one attack, but if they get one lucky hit in when he's distracted, he's done. Sonic lampshades how weird it is that the rings aren't here when normally they're spread all over the planet. And he shows humility, saying that he needs some vital energy and won't hold much longer. Wait, he's literally physiologically dependent on rings? How can they be vital energy? How does that make sense? I hope that's not what they're trying to convey. He's not literally a being of chaos energy who would fade away without it. But then the river goes into a waterfall and Sonic falls off it screaming all the way instead of Tails simply grabbing him and flying with him like it's no big deal. Why is Tails here if he's not gonna ever do anything? At least the comic's trying to be a tense, exciting action story, instead of horribly failing at comedy the whole time. So at least it's got the tone right. But that should be the standard. An average isn't impressive. A good tone won't stop me from being annoyed if there's nothing but Deus Ex Machina's for Sonic. They're lucky I'm still finding this tense and exciting at this point. After Tails has bad dialogue again, and Sonic reveals he can magically sense ring energy, the heroes are relieved to fall into the water, even though falling from that height into water would be like hitting concrete. Realistically, they wouldn't be smiling when they hit the water. They'd be in a horrible pain. 
But they'd have been fine either way because they immediately discover all the rings they need. Well, how convenient. Of all the places that could have been hidden, Tails reveals there's thousands of rings. In Archie, this amount of rings turns Sonic and Tails into Ultra Sonic and Hyper Tails from the sheer amount of Chaos Energy in one place. But that'd be too interesting. Plus, it'd be a way too easy way for them to beat all the badniks at once, meaning that wouldn't be a very exciting Sonic 3 ripoff. Sonic expects us to believe the Jungle River gathered all these rings here, but that still doesn't explain how there aren't any rings in the jungle itself. But maybe there are? Then Sonic makes some clumsy foreshadowing that he's gonna get threatened again really soon because he thinks that Eggman can do nothing against them in this canon, and they've never been so safe. They get sent towards another waterfall, and we see a huge ton of red people working on the cliffs with ladders, almost like they're all echidnas, and they're living in a village in a bunch of different caves. Impressive that they're all still alive, but it's too late for the comic to get interesting by this point. They fall off the cliff as they see an echidna with a caveman spear, and some mine pyramids blow Sonic and Tails. This mine ripoff echidna tribe concept has to have been the official Sega lore, because it's been in the SCC as well, long before Sonic Adventure came out. So why didn't they bother sharing this with Archie? Well, Archie did something actually creative with the echidnas, so it was worth it. It doesn't take any talent to rip off Mayan culture and call it a day. As they're falling, I see a smoky volcano right behind the pyramids, making me wonder if this will get the echidnas all killed anyways. Not that it matters, they're literally just a Mayan tribe and that's it. I could research that in real life in Wikipedia and learn everything about these echidnas that I want. The writer could have done that and gotten all the lore about the echidnas from there. That's not creative. This really makes it look pointless that Knuckles is the last echidna normally, because if he wasn't and he had a tribe of echidnas like this in the present day, nothing would actually change about Knuckles, because he'd still be guarding the Master Emerald, and these guys wouldn't matter any more than any other group of civilians in Sonic. Sonic and Tails fall in the water, somehow perfectly fine. I guess they're ring scattered and they're just invisible when they do that. And the echidnas start throwing spears at them immediately, assuming they're invaders, I guess, when there's only two of them. Why are the echidnas vilified every time they're portrayed in something other than Archie? We have this Sonic Adventure, the live-action Sonic movie. It really proves my point that them ripping off Aztecs does nothing to contribute positively. Because they're just portrayed as monsters to everyone not in their group. Which is not interesting, it's annoying. Penderus handled the echidnas with actual respect, where they were actual people. Because only the Dark Legion was really evil like this. Some fans think he did it wrong, just because he did it differently from the games, when what the games did is clearly not enjoyable. So anything would be better than this. Did anyone really like to call his father outside of SCC? Tails even calls the echidnas a band of savages. Way to prove my point. Sonic talks like Yoda for no reason, saying that they haven't always been savages, and they're the descendants of Mobius' first race. They left cities in ruins on all the continents of the planet, so how are they not savages then? That doesn't sound realistic for a whole group of people to want to do all at once. That's not mine of them, that's ancient Mongolian. It doesn't strike me as realistic that all of these guys would want to kill Sonic and Tails without even being provoked. They have no reason to think that they're a threat to their safety. Sonic and Tails don't have weapons. It'd make more sense if it was explained that every race other than the Echidnas have been trying to kill all of the Echidnas on sight since the dawn of time, and therefore they think they're in danger anytime they see a non-Echidna. And they all have weapons, so they can defend themselves instead of just running away in fear. But why would just the Echidnas be so persecuted by other species? Wouldn't that be the case for every species because they'd be a separate tribe from the others? and thus they be the same. Also, I hate the Sonic and Tails talk underwater. They swim underwater saying spin attack, but they aren't doing it. How could their spin attack be worthwhile out of the water? You can't simply jump out of the water. There would be nothing for you to press your feet against to start a jump. The canoes close in on them, and they all look like Knuckles. While Penders' work at least tried to differentiate the echidnas by giving them different colors and clothes and hairstyles, which was infinitely less lazy, obviously, compared to this. Sonic blasts out of the water and destroys one of the canoes, and Tails does the same with his fists, but I'm just wondering how the hell they built up so much speed underwater. 
What's the point of having these echidnas here if there's if, there, if it's going to be written in such a lazy and uninspired way? Some things are forgotten for a reason. This isn't just an obscure group of comic strips trapped in a British magazine. This was intended to be a full comic book. And yet this didn't sell nearly as well as Fleetway and Archie. It could have, but only got two issues. And no one can find the second one anywhere. So nowadays, they might as well just have one issue. With the Sonic fanbase being as excited and devoted as it is, to the point where even a live-action Sonic movie got an audience, this comic wouldn't have been stuck with just two issues without some very good reasons. It'd take a lot to make this fanbase that uninterested. Then Eggman flies over to Amy, who's in a UFO, or on a UFO, and, she, and he tells her that he hopes she had a good trip and he's glad to see her, calling her Miss, and he says that she will be quite useful. So I'm guessing he's taunting her and she's not actually on his side, and he plans to kidnap her, because it'd be too interesting otherwise. Of course, Amy hates him and says he smells terribly and asks if he's washed his feet. She also calls him outdated, and says that if he became an omelette, she wouldn't eat it. This is Amy at her best. Her establishing character moment has nothing to do with her fangirling over Sonic and being in love with him. And instead, it's about her being sassy against Robotnik, which he deserves, and implies that she has the potential to be a competent hero. Eggman threatens her, she taunts him some more, jumping on him, and he throws her. A sassy damsel in distress is still a damsel in distress at the end of the day, so what difference does this actually make? Eggman says Sonic is Amy's friend, and when she's told to shut up, she says, Okay, let's talk about your mustache, then. It doesn't bother them to live on a sewer? He's about to hit her when his robot tells him that his objective was located and he's awaiting his orders. That's one poorly programmed robot. That robot shouldn't have to go all the way over to him to get the next order if he's that unindependent that he needs an order after finding his objective instead of knowing what to do right away. He should just be in radio contact with Eggman. The next time we see Sonic and Tails, they're all trapped in nets, realistically, since they were in the water and surrounded the last time we saw them. And they're talking as if they just woke up. Sonic says he just has a few bruises, but he clearly isn't bruised at all. Sonic at least explains why they got captured so damn easily. They had to stop before someone got hurt, and Tails says it's not the same thing as flattening the Badnik's bodies. Eggman would be better off cyberizing organic people and sending nothing but them after Sonic, then, because he clearly can't handle fighting organics. I just have to wonder why Sonic is instantly spin-dashing out of the net and freeing Tails. He has no reason to humor them like this. Then it turns out that they really weren't gutsy enough to give Knuckles a brand new design, and this is actually Princess Elucion, who doesn't care what Sonic's name is. Sonic reveals that she has the Grey Emerald in her tiara, an apparently famous stone that Eggman's looked for for years. If it's so famous, why hasn't he found it already? If it's famous, people would know where it was, especially since she lives in a lost city, apparently, that Eggman doesn't know about. So why would the Grey Emerald be famous if it's lost to history? Also, why are the Echidnas able to speak Sonic and Tails' language just fine if they're so hostile to every non Echidna that they'd have no reason to intermingle with them, and thus they'd develop a different language? Elucion tells them to follow her, and Sonic and Tails are suddenly not restrained anymore. They're forced to follow her because of some soldiers behind them. She leads them to a smoking volcano, and there's a whole bunch of grey metal in front of them, twisted around each other. Is that supposed to be a bridge down to the volcano? She brags about her city, saying her architects are geniuses and there's tons of artists, and her lakes of lava are really hot. At least she has a loud, memorable personality. But if all of the Akinas were trying to kill Sonic and Tails right away, it's completely ridiculous that they didn't just immediately kill them instead of capturing them. And that the princess didn't try to kill them either. They went after Sonic with spears! That can't be put on stun! I'm glad the comic finally got interesting with the whole village of Echidnas that are still alive, but Archie did this concept much more creatively. The Echidnas were actually advanced, instead of, like, them just having artists and architects is not impressive. They're, they're not advanced, they're still just Mayan people with spears. They don't have any robots around. And the Echidnas weren't totally demonized at Archie to the point where you want them to be destroyed by a volcano. 
So we need something much better than this for an interesting hook. At least it's got an original character. Sonic snarks, great, how do we buy postcards? And Tails lectures him to not annoy the princess. She says she likes his courage, as well as his nice blue color. But then after she just complimented him, she says he'll make a nice spark when he gets there. So does she want to push him into the volcano? He just said in front of her that Robotnik's looking for the emerald, but she doesn't see him as an ally against him. They just hate all Echidnas, apparently. This is written like a hate fic fan fiction by someone who hated that there were other Echidnas in Archie. It's not necessary to write them to be hateful like this. They could just be some regular group of civilians. Why does she want to destroy Sonic and Tails when they did nothing to her, and she even said she likes Sonic's courage? Then Eggman sends his badniks to attack the Echidna City, and I'm rooting for him at this point. He'll unintentionally save Sonic this way. And Sonic, for no reason at all, saves the princess from Eggman's missile. And Eggman just assumes he destroyed Sonic with the missile when Sonic is super fast. I'm hoping that Sonic saving the princess was planned to get the Echidnas to change their ways about demonizing non-Echidnas, because that would actually be good writing. Right after Sonic saved her, she calls him a fool! And she explains that the slide they're apparently on brings them towards certain death. Sonic says that he's having fun with it because it's so fast. Where'd the slide even come from? Was this the twisted metal from earlier? And how did Sonic know it would bring him towards death anyways? Also, somehow Eggman didn't know the Kidna City existed and thinks it's a lost city, and the planet is full of surprises. You'd think the whole planet would be mapped out by now. What, is it stuck in the Dark Ages? Then how does Eggman have access to the scientific knowledge that would let him make his inventions? A badnik tells him he got a signal, and Eggman looks over a cliff. It turns out Tails is now in a separate slide from Sonic, and I guess he can't start flying until he jumps. And there's no way to jump when sliding, so okay, that makes sense. I'm confused about how they got separated, though. Eggman goes after Sonic in the Eggmobile. The next page is completely wasted. Sonic should be explaining who Eggman is properly, not just saying he bothered him. How does he expect Elucion to think he's a good guy? Eggman threatens him with a really edgy line. Elucion says he smells, and he takes her Grey Emerald. And her, since he kidnaps her. Good riddance. Sonic heads towards some lava and panics, but I'm sure Tails will save him. After all, Tails can fly. Also, they used the wrong Yor. We didn't need three entire panels wasted on Sonic worrying that he'll get thrown into the lava. We're not stupid enough to think they'd actually kill him off, so why waste three entire panels on artificial tension? Four panels, even! Amy's tied by a rope and is hanging below a flying badnik, and Sonic wants to save her, and Tails tells him not to because it's a trap. What a great friend. Sonic grabs Amy by the ankle, and she wonders what he plans to do to save her. It turns out the flying badniks bring them both towards the volcano. Eggman cuts the rope to send them into the volcano. Eggman takes a picture of them, saying he'll hang it over a chimney. And he trails off when he asks the princess to give him the emerald, implying that she'll attack him afterwards. Why didn't he just take off her tiara a long time ago and throw her out of the Eggmobile? He doesn't need her. It's not like he can roboticize people, so why keep her around? It's obvious Tails will save Sonic by flying, so why is it taking so long? She bites his fist, and out of complete nowhere, she jumps towards the volcano. I guess she'll do anything to keep him from getting it. Eggman decides to just go home, assuming they'll all be destroyed. Somehow, Tails hadn't gone into the volcano to save Sonic. I guess he forgot he could fly. So it's the shiny new character who will probably save them. After an entire page was wasted on Tails being upset and swearing revenge, shockingly, two pages were wasted. And he flies away convinced that he lost his friends without even trying to go save them. Was this supposed to be funny? Because it's just a waste of comic space. Out of complete and utter nowhere, a golden ring shows up to save everyone from the volcano. With no foreshadowing and no explanation, it's not like Sonic got 50 rings and passed by a gold post. If this ring could have shown up, what took it so long? Surprisingly, the ring even literally sent Sonic and Amy to a special stage, the Blue Spears minigame specifically. But where's Elucion? Wouldn't she be with them? If a giant ring can just show up wherever after Sonic collected enough rings, with no clear indication of how much time had passed and how much time needs to pass, 
Then it's just turning the big ring at the end of the level to a deus ex machina to get Sonic out of any tight situation. And Amy still isn't fangirling over Sonic. She doesn't even have a crush on him. So we avoid her being annoying. Sonic does all the work by himself, destroying the point of having Amy with him there. Though it does make sense since he's so fast. And all of a sudden, Lucian reveals herself to be here, and she says that the special stage was the Antique Challenge, and only the greatest Ikenna warriors have managed such a score. So, did they have super speed? With guardian powers? And she gives him the seven magical emeralds, the golden armor, and the power to be transported wherever he wants. That's overkill compared to just getting one emerald. Wouldn't she hate them because they're not Echidnas and never give them anything? Wasn't that the whole reason the Echidnas attacked them in the first place? Then an entire page is wasted on Tails concluding a story around a campfire about Sonic's demise, the civilians despairing, and then Sonic and Tails are warped right over to Tails. Two entire panels were wasted. I don't think Tails would be in the emotional state to eloquently tell people a tale of how Sonic died right after it happened. The random civilians are more upset than he is. Tails hugs Amy instead of Sonic, without any explanation that she's like a big sister to him. And Sonic's so-called golden armor is just him being supersonic. Because fuck originality. That's the whole message of this comic. Too bad this comic only had two issues. Gee, maybe it's because they were so much like the games that fans didn't find it interesting enough. Maybe that's why IDW Sonic's selling badly too. This just proves that alternate continuities of Sonic need originality. Because they need a lot of interesting hooks to really sell. And without enough originality, most fans won't bother with it. Because it's not interesting. The most interesting thing about this comic was that the Kinnas are all still alive. And because they just rip off an Aztec tribe for them anyways, and make them all hateful people you don't care about, was it really worth it to see them? That wasn't creative and enjoyable. Knuckles never shows up, so what's the point of having them be Echidnas if it's not going to relate to him? So they might as well be foxes. I like Princess Illusion, I suppose. I hated that she tried to kill Sonic even after she complimented him. But she was sassy against Robotnik. So was Amy, though. But it was entertaining how hammy and proud she was of her city. When you don't even try to have a unique hook, the continuity feels lazy and uninspired. And until we got to the Lost Echidna City, it was way too much like the games. So the comic lost my interest two pages in. This isn't literally canon to the games. No, of course not, because it's not the exact same story to a T. So there's no point in making it as similar to the game's canon as possible when it's not canon to the game, no matter how much it wants to be. Considering that it's too much like the games, and considering that the story didn't even try to make sense with its deus ex machinas for Sonic, I wasn't impressed. Why well, be impressed by lazy writing? Sonic just bursts out of the chains no problem. He jumps out of the water at high speed, and he shakes off the piranhas way too easily. It's impressive there was any tension and excitement at all. They didn't care about having the writing make sense. That's why he didn't spin dash out of a net. If I want a Sonic story that's written like it takes place in the universe of the games, I just read fanfiction. Because there's billions of stories doing that on fanfiction.net right now. <laughs>